to End Time Talk Radio, where the truth is usually stranger than fiction. The purpose of these shows are not to scare you, but to prepare you, because what you don't know could hurt you. The word says in Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Thank you for joining us. My name is Julie, and here is the host of the show, Barry Meyer. Welcome to End Time Talk Radio. We have a great show. I want to mention a few things that you may want to keep an eye on. Um, of course, you can go to barry-julie.blogspot.com and catch all the current news that's currently going on. But uh, China, China's credit uh, crisis in Beijing orders urgent uh, audit of all government debt on the heels of downgrade, estimated as high as 80% of GDP. Um, before I forget, also today is July 30th of 2013. Also in Chicago land, cash reserves plunge, debt triples. And I think right now when I've seen the news this morning was at 33 million or something like that, which isn't much for Chicago. Of course, you know, with Detroit, that's going on. Um, also, next week, we're going to have uh, Sheriff Justin Smith out of Fort Collins, Colorado. He's going to be talking about uh, what's going on with uh, the gun laws. Uh, maybe we'll even touch on the 51st state that's going on. Um, most of you may not realize that he actually covered a lot of the expenses that he's actually going after um, the people that are trying to take our gun rights. So definitely watch him for that interview. Um, also, in um, the Longmont uh, newspaper down there, uh, the residents support Well County's first 51st state idea of meeting. So definitely watch what's going on there. Uh, it's definitely um, getting hotter down there. Um, don't push us off. Be watch what's going on. Because our next interview here, which is coming up right now, we have D.C. Allen. Now, he contacted me um, through the things I've been watching with the 51st state. And I think you definitely need to keep an eye, idea, an eye you know, an eye on this. And um, now the book he wrote is called July 4th, 2014, The Day That Freedom Shall Be Restored. Just a little bit here. It is 1775 again, and are you ready to be free? July 4th, 2014, The Day That Freedom Shall Be Restored is an explosive new book by D.C. Allen, part philosophy, part policy, part history, part commentary, and 100% outrageous. Now, we're going to throw this in there. Except there's going to be one little thing that's going to clog up this evil machine, and it's going to be you. Look in the mirror. You're the one that's that wrench, and we have to. You have one more chance to get this right. DC Allen, welcome to End Time Talk Radio. Thank you, Barry. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, I, I guess. Well, thank you. You know, for the listeners out there, maybe give a little background to yourself and how you got this book uh, started. Well, as you mentioned, the title of my book is July 4, 2014 the day that freedom shall be restored. And the premise behind my book is that if you want to accomplish something, you need to establish a deadline Mm -hmm. and follow the course of action necessary to meet your goal by the deadline. Now, all of life involves deadlines, you know, on the job, at school, around the house, within our relationships, in each of our activities. This is the way that the world works. We have deadlines. Sometimes Mm -hmm. they're deadlines that humans impose on their on themselves, or sometimes they are deadlines that nature imposes throughout the cycle of life. Yet, regardless, it's the way that the world works. We have to meet deadlines. Well, for something as important as our political life, how can we not act with the same sense of urgency? So that was what motivated my book. Yeah, um, the book had its origins. I remember it was March of 2011. I spent a weekend daydreaming, and I don't remember now which particular Obama inspired it, but I was daydreaming about what would you actually have to do to establish a free society in opposition to the bureaucratic soft despotism that we have right now. And um, because it had become pretty clear by that point that we are on the brink of a terrible political calamity and we're past the point of a negotiated solution. And so I was just, just daydreaming, speculating, what would you have to do to establish a free society. And I decided, don't just daydream about it, write a book about it. So that was how the idea for writing the book got started. You know, currently, as I'm reading the book, I'm about 50% through it. And I would recommend this book highly to my listeners. Those of you listening, 
don't just listen to this interview, but I recommend that you definitely get this book. It'll be eye-opening. It'll give you ideas and thoughts and things that you've never maybe looked at before. DC. Oh, yeah, I appreciate your um, your recommendation there, and I, I just want for your listeners to know that uh, the book is available through both Amazon, Kindle, and Barnes & Noble Nook for a very reasonable price. July 4, 2014, the day that freedom shall be restored. And I want to also mention that you can also check on what you're doing on July 4, July 4 2014.blogspot.com. Also, July 4th, 2014.wordpress.com. Anything else you'd like to mention? Let's see. Um, yeah, on my blog, you can read excerpts from the book and you can. Um, uh, read some of my commentary on current events and how it relates to the book. And you mentioned earlier that I got, in, uh, you know, we got in contact with each other as a result of the uh, uh, 51st state secession movement that began in North Colorado but has now spread throughout the state and also uh, has shown some interest in Kansas and Nebraska as well. And I, um, I learned about this movement in June just through reports on the national news. And it's it's of great interest to me because it is the uh, first prominent secession movement within the United States that has arisen since my book was published. I mentioned in my book that there are four possible options for how to establish a free society, and territorial secession is one of them. So I'm taking a great interest in what happens in Colorado, and um, and that's, of course, how you and I came in contact with each other. Yeah, it's very exciting what's going on down there. Of course, I'm only 11 miles north of that, so you know, it, it's a great interest interest for me. Matter of fact, I have contacts in Greeley, Colorado, that are actually keeping me abreast of what's going on, right. so um, I'm very excited about this. Now, you talked about the four steps, um, if we may call it that, of um, how would you want to call it, where you have different steps that we can kind of go through, secession or something. You want to kind of explain yeah. it? It's four different options for how to establish a free society. And each one of these options has attractive and unattractive features. It has advantages and disadvantages. And people need to think about which of these four options will be the most suitable. The, those four options, the first one is simply voting into office, politicians and other elected leaders who will be faithful to the principles of freedom. They will repeal any laws or acts or uh, other measures that have restricted our freedom up to now and will not uh, impose greater restrictions on our liberties henceforth. So the first option is voting. That's the most attractive in some mm -hmm. ways, but it's also the most difficult to achieve results. The second option is armed insurrection. Now, that's the least attractive for many evident reasons, and yet it also is one to which um, people have had to resort throughout history and the founding of this nation would be the one that's most familiar to us. The third option is territorial secession, and the um, which, you know, in some ways it, it's attractive and that you can just start fresh, but in other ways uh, it does present some challenges, you know, where you have the uh, minimum of people and resources necessary for a self-sustaining society, what's going to happen in your relations with the entity from which you're trying to proceed. So mm -hmm. it's both attractive and unattractive. And finally, the fourth option is creating a parallel society where you might live within the larger society, but you don't submit to it. And this is something that never really has been tried, so it's, it's difficult to evaluate. You can speculate on it, but it's hard to evaluate. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the closest parallel or the closest... Um, analogy we might have to that is the stereotypical person living off the grid in Idaho. But that's usually just a small number of people, not a self-sustaining society. So that one's hard to evaluate right now. But those are the four options. Voting, armed insurrection, territorial secession, or establishing a parallel society. Well, I know, I know the first one isn't really working too well. Um, right. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I've actually called the local radio station a few times and you know, they'll always say, well, you know, you got to get involved. you got to get uh, calling and stuff. But, you know, our calls become on de deaf ears, uh, whether it's impeachment of Obama, whether it's city council, whether it's um, something with county commissioners, um, different things. Of course, we do have one county commissioner that does this, and he is Tea Party. But on, on for the most part, um, D 
DC, we don't see many people that are willing to listen. And I think it's time to the point where people have said, okay, can you hear me now? And we're going to go beyond that. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what's happening in Colorado right now. Um, they've realized that they're past the point of any negotiated solution, and they're not willing to see a uh, greater erosion of their liberties. So, um, you know, what, what, one of the... Um, one of the objections to the ideas that I've brought forth is, well, it's, it's just not realistic. It's too fanciful, you know, too idealistic, mm -hmm. not practical, too difficult. It's going to take too much time. You know, you, it's okay to have that view, um, but I want to point out two things for your listeners in response to that. The first is that the, um, the Second Continental Congress on June 7, 1776, passed a resolution for drafting a statement 27 days later, a mere 27 days later, the Declaration of Independence was issued. Mm -hmm. And there, there is no reason why we cannot follow their example. And then also in response to the notion, well, it's just not realistic. You know, too many challenges, too many problems. It's going to take too much time. Again, it's okay to believe that, but let me tell you who doesn't believe that. It's the left. Mm -hmm. The left, all the time, they set goals. They decide what steps they need to take to meet their goals. They organize. They follow those steps. And they are very, very good at it. So if you want to say that this is too ambitious, too difficult, it's going to have too many problems, that's fine. But if you do that, we're going to continue to surrender the public sphere to the left. And I'm not willing to do that anymore. And I think we're seeing in Colorado that a lot of people there are not willing to do it anymore. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that does kind of bug me about this is that really here in Wyoming, it's really been hushed on our paper and our radio. Um, people don't want to really talk about it too much. Never. Yeah, so I don't know if, well, we have a lot of liberal media up here too. <laughs> and so um, we're fighting. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, we did, the city just passed UDC codes last week. So, oh. yeah, they just passed those things and Jenna 21, you know, and so on and so forth. Um you know, when we try to bring this up, you know, people say, well, you know, that's been done before. It's same old, same is. But we're not looking at a time that's the same properties of how we've had it before. Yeah, there, the left has become a lot more aggressive um, in recent generations, and I think that they were emboldened by the rise of Barack Obama. And, um, the, and, and we're seeing the results of that. The... Um, you know, the economic despair, um, just the general hatefulness, the divisiveness. We're seeing the results of what the left has been trying to do for generations. And and people do have a sense of urgency. And what I've tried to do with my book is to not only to reinforce that sense of urgency, but to give people some sort of guideline or some sort of handbook on how they can act upon uh, act upon what's happening. But probably, probably what you've found and what I've found is that most most political conservatives aren't by nature political activists. Mm -hmm. We want to live and let live and live our lives, devote our time to our families and our jobs, and our self-improvement and so forth. It, it's just not in our nature to be political fighters, and yet it's what we're going to have to do if we're going to pre prevent these catastrophes from happening. Um, DC, I have to ask you, um, in my correspondence with you, I never did ask you, I should have, um, of course, you do have some scripture verses. Are you a Christian? Um, I let's just say I've studied uh, Christianity and Judaism uh, in great depth. Okay, okay. I just had, I've had to ask. I just had to ask real quick on that. Um, I, I, there's an old saying I heard. You know, it's easier to make a warrior a Christian than it is a Christian a warrior. And what I'm saying by that is, so many people are so path, pacifist anymore that um, they won't stand up for rights because you talk about rights in your book. Mm -hmm. It's um, yeah, that's an interesting, um, interesting way to phrase it. Um, that people are pacifists. Um, sometimes it's a combination of just good naturedness. People mm -hmm. don't want to fight. They they don't want to be in conflict. They want to get along. And sometimes it's complacency. Um, but um, yeah, e either way, I think we've reached a point that if people don't. Uh, if they don't fight back and if they, if they don't take seriously what's happening, they're going to find that um, they're going to find a lot of despair, a lot of economic ruin. Uh, you know, I, I describe the political left as a nihilistic movement. Mm -hmm. 
that leaves misery, destruction, and death wherever they go. And you mentioned in your news recap uh, events in Detroit. Mm-hmm. Detroit is it's the greatest monument to the political left that there is in this nation. <laughs> That's uh, a good monument, isn't it? Yeah, but the misery and the, and the destruction that's there. I don't know if you read um, the political commentator Mark Stein. I've heard of him, yes. Yeah, he, he's a political commentator, commentator from Canada who is uh, very popular. And, and he says that if you take a look at Detroit, usually it takes a foreign invader to do uh, to bring about the kind type of destruction that you've seen in Detroit. But these are people who did it to themselves through their left-wing policies. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very true. You know, it's just sad because we're seeing these things happen. Matter of fact, I've known people that have been Democrats, and then they'll actually get the vote. They'll get the, you know, they'll go to Republican. They'll get their Democrat friends to vote for them. And of course, and you know what? I'll be honest. With you, I have a family member that did it here, here in um, here in Wyoming. So, um, you know, I mean, things people say that if you're Republican, you got to be good. Well, that's not always so anymore. Um. Yeah. It, it's hard to explain why that happens, but it's true that a lot of the erosions of our liberties and too many compromises with the left have taken place under Republicans. Mm-hmm. You know, I these reach across the aisle and get things done, Republicans. But they're almost worse than the Democrats because we know what to expect from the Democrats. Yeah. But we expect better from the Republicans, and they're betraying us when they do that. So, and, and it's interesting... Um, um, you know, the, um, there's an anticipated uh, Republican primary contest in your state, in Wyoming, mm-hmm. between um, the current Senator Mike Enzi and uh, the challenger, Liz Cheney. And this has attracted some attention outside of Wyoming as well. And I'd like to read uh, for you and for your listeners a comment that was made on the Town Hall website sure. by Kurt Schlichter. He says that Mike Enzi wants to be a sober, serious legislator working with his liberal friends across the aisle to make it a better country. Except that there are no friends across the aisle, and liberals do not want to make this a better country. Liberals want to ruthlessly acquire and maintain power and control over every aspect of our lives. And anyone who does not see and understand that, and who can't commit to destroying their hideous plans for our country, needs to get out of the way for a true conservative warrior. Hmm. And I, I think that is a, that's a reflection of what has been happening throughout the nation and in most localities for many generations. And a lot of people are starting to wake up to the dangers of that. You know, uh, the local radio station have actually multiple times asked you know, Senator Enzi to come on and just talk about it. He will not do it. Right? Yeah, he will not come on our local station, which hits all the way down to Denver, up to Casper and, and whatnot. Um but the idea is that, you know, if you're running a political office, you should be able to be there for the constituents to hear what you're talking about. That's right. And yeah. it's very sad. And, um, let's see, and, and you, if I can go back to something that you said earlier. Sure. Um, you know, referring to Christianity and to um, religious principles. Um, I'd like to note for your readers that uh, one part of my book I try to explore the historical origins of the principles of freedom as they've come to be known within Western civilization. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I identify that as having its origin in Jewish civilization, ancient Jewish civilization. And um, it was through Christianity primarily, but also through other sources, that uh, Jewish ethical principles made their way into Europe and into Western civilization. And that, so that, that's the ultimate source. And if you... If you do want to understand freedom and why it's important and a moral vision that leaves us predisposed to liberty, it's important to understand the uh, Jewish and Christian origins of those ideals. Why do you... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and since you and I have been in contact, you know, I've discovered that um, there are two important things in common between what I've written and between things that you and some of your other guests have said. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first is to emphasize the moral and ethical dimension of our political life. And the second is to emphasize that we need to take responsibility for our lives in the face of what things might be coming. We can't be passive about it. We do need to take active responsibility for what we do or for what we don't do. 
That's very true. Um, you know, I actually had um, really got into it really with somebody at the on the radio, and it wasn't like with them, but it was with what the politicians are doing. Um, they're talking about putting meters in all our wells now, and I mean, I was just livid. I'm like, what do you? Your book talks about that when people start getting their property rights taken away, they're taken away from you. That's right. That's right. That's um, that's an old idea. Um, the connection between um, or the ethical dimension of property rights. I mean, in the core legal code of Judaism, 20%, collective one-fifth, is devoted to the sanctity of private property. You shall not steal and you shall not covet. And as these ideas became refined through the centuries, through the millennia, then by the time of John Locke, you see the importance of property as an extension of one's person. And that's why it has to be respected and protected. And, and you're right, all this micro-regulation and uh, dictating our lives and our property, uh, you know, they say time is money. Yes. That's an old aphorism. That means every time the government takes away from your property, takes away from your money, either through taxes or through regulation, well, they've taken away some of your time, a precious part of your life that you never will get back. And people need to think about that. That's very true. Um, so often... When I try to bring up news stories with people, they just think it's kind of, oh, that's hogwash or whatever. And they want, they really want to um, kind of explain it away. They, in a sense, what I mean by that is they want to push it away. They, I don't want to hear about it. But the thing is, it's all coming our way. And so now, I guess let me pose this question to you, DC. When you pose this, uh, this book to people and they read it or you talk about these things, how are they responding out there and where you're at? Uh, I guess the best way that you could describe it is bewildered curiosity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, they, um, um, yeah. People are interested in the ideas, but um, skeptical about setting a deadline so soon, July 4, 2014. Um, yeah, I, I should mention, I uh, in March, I went at the CPAC, the Conservative mm -hmm. Political Action Conference, which is held near Washington every year. And, um, and then it was to try to promote the book after I uh, published it. And, and that, uh, I guess that's the best way to describe the response of most people, the wildered curiosity. Yeah. Um, if people are sympathetic with the ideas gen generally. They don't see it as a very realistic goal. Well, you know, and the reason why I brought that up is that we actually have a gentleman, um, Herm um, I don't think Herman Cain, it's not Herman Cain. Um, I'll, I'll think of it. Um, but he's actually running for governor of Wyoming, and he came on the radio show, and he said, you guys don't realize it. This is our last chance, this, like you're talking about in your book. He said, you guys think that everything is going to ripple back again like it was every time like it has before. Things are changing, he said. You need to wake up. Um, it's Taylor Haynes. He's running for governor, um, and he really ran a good run last time. Uh, of course, you know, he ran against Matt Mead and Ross, but... He's warning the people that, hey, this is your last chance. That, you know, that's about the most basic and fundamental and urgent way that you can say it. This is our last chance. These things are not going to just happen because we, we want them badly enough. You, you have to make things happen. And, and, again, it's not in our nature as conservatives to be political activists. Mm -hmm. But we do have to open our eyes and, and take responsibility for that. Because if, if you if you want to know who is very good at making things happen, again, it's the left. You know, it, 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 there's another aphorism I like to quote: which is, okay. the "Power is a vacuum that never remains unfilled." That's right. So if we don't take responsibility for governing our lives politically in the way that they should be governed, then someone else is going to do it. And we've seen uh, we've seen their success at doing that, and the disastrous results of it. So yeah, I'm glad. Um, uh, I'm glad this candidate for governor speaks with that sort of urgency because not many politicians will. Okay, so let's say we go beyond July 4th, 2014, and, you know, all these different elections or all that going on. How long, how far in the future, I, I know you can't just put a date on it, but how far in the future before we see the catastrophic results of our not doing anything? It's hard to predict. If you look throughout history, you know, when we identify certain cataclysmic events, sometimes it appears as if they came on all of a sudden, even though with historical hindsight we can trace 
uh, the origins of them much further back. Sometimes it appears as if they came on all of a sudden and people weren't prepared for it. Um, I'm pessimistic mm -hmm. about the future of the United States as we know it. But I'm optimistic about the prospect for people who do understand the importance of personal liberty and who are willing to band together. I'm optimistic about those people for finding each other and taking a stand and defending themselves. Yes. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I am pessimistic that there will be a great uh, political calamity uh, throughout the United States, in fact, throughout most of the world. People say, oh, it can't happen here. Look at all the you know, tranquility and prosperity and, and stability in the United States. Well, just remember, the higher you rise, the further you can fall. Mm. So as great as this country has become, it also could come into something very, very terrible. I'm, I'm trying to look for the article that you wrote, I think it was to the Daily Camera. Was it in Boulder? Uh, yeah. Can yeah, you talk uh, about that a little bit? Yeah, thank you for sure. that. Yeah. After I learned about the uh, 51st State movement in Colorado that began in North Colorado and now has spread throughout the state and to Kansas, Nebraska as well, I, um, as I was uh, following the story, I came across the, uh, an article in the Daily Camera, the largest newspaper in Boulder, Colorado, that had been written by five members of their editorial advisory board. Mm -hmm. And uh, each of these five members wrote a short piece of commentary criticizing the, um, criticizing the secession movement. And some of them, some of the, some, a few of the writers were somewhat conciliatory, saying that the, uh, the liberals in Colorado needed to make more of an effort uh, to engage people in rural Colorado. Others of this editorial advisory board were very dismissive and very contemptuous. What I am, um, I thought about writing a response to publish in the Daily Camera, and by the time I was finished, it was <laughs> 14,000 words long, which I knew would be too long to submit to the newspaper, either in Boulder or I thought about it in Greeley, but both of them have uh, policies longer, but that would be too long. So I decided to publish the article on my blog, and um, so far it's been the most read piece on my blog. I'm assuming that a lot of people are searching for mm -hmm. information about North Colorado and, and coming across it. But um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, this secession movement in Colorado is the first prominent secession movement in favor of liberty that has arisen since my book was published. So it's a it's of great interest to me, and I did um, I did reside in Colorado for a few years in the early 1990s, so I'm familiar with the state, and I've been aware about how some of these issues have been percolating for you know, a few decades now. Um, and, uh, so what's impressive is how quickly the uh, people in Weld County and elsewhere have mobilized in uh, in support of this movement. So, when I I was going through your blog last night, and you had some of the stuff on Wall County with their um, county commissioner, and I don't remember her name at this time, but she really gave up a good a good talk about what's going on and how it's not about Democrats and Republicans. Let's see. Um, that post I think was on the fifty first state of Facebook page, rather okay. than on my blog. So okay. I to tell you the truth, I, I haven't read that yet, so I'm not sure what she said. Okay. But if, if you if you remember it, I'd be interested in hearing about it. I, I, you know, um, you know, I watched it and um, I couldn't quite quote it or nothing. But she was basically saying that it's not about Democrats or Republicans; it's about us. You know, we're just people. Um, but you know, you 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 see so many things to get prepared. You kind of like you know you cross things. Um, one of the things I find interesting: I, I work for a big, huge company that's nationwide, and so um, of course when we call different stores like down in Fort Collins, I kind of mentioned to this, and this one guy down there says, "Good, we don't need them anymore." So there is a contention of, you know, we're on this side of the line, and we don't need these people on that side of the line. You know, there are a number of objections that have been, that have been put forth to the secession movement, and some of them are sentimental. People don't want to see the state that they love broken apart, and that's understandable, although, you know, at some point you have to weigh uh, whether, whether that's a compelling enough reason. Then there are those who, who say that... Um, that North Colorado does not, the rural parts of Colorado, don't have enough economic resources to survive. Mm -hmm. Well, then, on the other hand, there are the folks that say, well, yes, we do, and we don't need them anymore. 
And I think it's important to remember, uh, referring back to 1776, you know, there, there was no advantage to separating from the wealthiest and mightiest empire of the day. And by most standard measures of political and military success, the revolution was a lost cause for most of the years that it was uh, that it was pursued. But it reflects well on the, the tenacity and the perseverance and the commitment to their belief that they are right and that their ideals are right, that it ended up succeeding. And and even even despite separation from the wealthiest and mightiest empire of the day, an even greater nation grew from that. So I, I think the folks in rural Colorado would be making a mistake if they became intimidated or or um, apprehensive about what might happen, because uh, they might not realize it, but they, they have it within themselves to make this succeed. Uh, with Well County, they're saying that um, 70% of all the, the funding for the schools in the whole state come right through Well County. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I, uh, I read an interesting statistic. Uh, as most people know, the Central Valley of California is the greatest agricultural region of the United States. Mm -hmm. East of the Rocky Mountains, Weld County is the greatest agricultural region. So there's the agriculture, there's the energy resources, there are the other industries. I wouldn't, so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that statistic were true about Weld County. And then this is another, uh, another thing to bring up. Um, they mentioned, when I talked to people in Greeley, they said they have enough cattle down there to equal or more than the amount of all the whole Middle East for cattle um, production. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, they, I, I would guess, again, I'm, I'm not an economist who's researched this, but I would guess that those parts of Colorado have plenty, of, not only do they have plenty of economic resources, it's a highly diversified economy that would do just fine if, mm -hmm. if they were on their own. I, I, I tend to think that more of Colorado is going to go that way only because um, just a few weeks ago I was in the central part of Colorado about two weeks ago, and I was talking to a guy at a pawn shop, and um, the more I talked about guns, um, the more he gave to my mom. She wanted to buy ammo, so that was good for her. But um, he was saying that that's the very conservative valley, and he's talking about, like, lead bill being a visceral slide oh, yeah. and stuff like that. And he said that um, when it comes down to it, we're going to fight. We're not going to sit back and take it. Good. <laughs> that's the right idea, and I hope more people in Colorado will uh, make the same commitment. Well, you know, and the thing is, when you start realizing, hey, this is more than um, – you know, your job or more than your, you know, I mean, this is your home. This is going to be your family, your friends, your neighbors. You, you start getting a little bit like perturbed by it. You start really getting like, you know what? Um, what was that song by Twisted Sister? We ain't going to take it anymore. We ain't going to take it. Yeah. <laughs> singer of that group, it, you know, at the time people said, well, this song's way too violent, and he said, it's no more violent than the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> wow. And and that's that's just a good way to sum it up. We're not going to take it anymore. You know, there's a there's another group out there, um, they're called the Sons of Liberty, and they're actually standing up, and they're going around the, the, the country, um, you know, getting people aware to what they've lost to the Constitution, their rights, um, because if you, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power, that's right, that's right. I, um, I'm glad that you mentioned that, and I'll try to find it. I uh, quoted James Madison in my, uh, in my book. He said, um, if I can find it here. Oh, yeah. A people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with, with the power which knowledge gives. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. A people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. That was James Madison the architect of the Constitution. And uh, it was true then, and it's true now. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, you know, when, what was sad is 
I actually called up uh, Cynthia Lummis office, our rep lone rep representative here, and I just basically said, I want to see Obama impeached. I mean, that's what I just said that. I get this big letter back saying, you know, I don't agree with all this different things happening, but I, I just you know, see no ways or means of, of, of impeachment. And when I called the radio station up, I said, so if I did Fast and Furious, I'd be in prison. I'd break the statutes down there. Yeah, um, you know, that the uh, power of impeachment is one of the most important uh, checks that Congress has on the executive branch. And any member of Congress is authorized to introduce articles of impeachment into the House Judiciary Committee. But, you know, oh, no, you can't do that. That's, that's, that's not polite. We, have, yeah. we, we can't have that. We, we need to work together. I mean, I mean John Boehner, Republican Speaker of the House, he's... He said that he absolutely trusts Obama, and we're going to work with the White House. John Boehner is irrelevant to the future of freedom in this country. And, and you're right to call up your representative and demand that, because, because if any Republican member of the House of Representatives doesn't, you know, doesn't stand up to, to the Obama administration, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, and, um, I talked to a former IRS auditor that lives out here, and I, I, I told him about my correspondence with a representative and he went to college with her he says yeah she ain't gonna listen you know and he he was nice to saying that she was kind of like a um i blow um like a airhead or something like that you know she's not gonna listen and because she's married to a high up lawyer and this and that so you know it's the prestige of the name i guess um but that being said um let me ask you this so you used to live in colorado so did you move to the East Coast because you've seen what was going on, and that's where you felt maybe it's safe to be? Um, I actually grew up uh, in this part of the country where I'm okay. now. And um, let's see, yeah, I um, let's see. I've lived most of my adult life in the Washington area. I lived for a few years in the left wing part of Colorado. I attended a, um, a liberal arts college on the East Coast, so I've spent most of my adult life in a left wing environment. Mm -hmm. I've I've known a lot of good people who advocate very bad and very dangerous ideas. And, and so I, I've had some time to speculate why that is. How, how do these left-wing ideas become part of the norm? And how can people who, who are good people, who have good ethical standards, how do they come to advocate these ideas? Mm -hmm. um, part of that, a lot of that's part of what motivated some of the ruminations in my book. I guess the reason why I ask is that not only myself, but multiple people that I know have already moved outside of the towns into the country to get more self-sufficient. Um, and so that's where I had to ask. Um, and so, um, you know, with, with all these things that are being drummed up, you know, thrown out there, do you think uh, people are going to awaken? Do you think it's going to be enough shocking? Or is it going to have to go through the whole thing before things, where people start changing their ideas on how things are going? One of the... Um one of the really encouraging things about the past four or five years or so is seeing the numbers of people who have awakened to the uh, to the dangers. You know, we saw the formation of the Tea Party movement four years ago, and uh, people attending town hall meetings with their congressmen, where probably very few people had attended in previous years. So it is very encouraging uh, to see how many people have awakened to this, and and the media keeps trying to downplay all of it. They say, well. It's it's just a fringe movement. Well, people aren't so concerned about it anymore. But that's not true. You know that from uh, from your program and from your interaction with community. Um, so enough people are waking to the danger. Whether or not they're going to take action or what type of action they're going to take, it's hard to say. Hard to say. Yeah. Um, gosh, I can't remember which founding father, and I'll have to look for it. Um, but basically, he said, if you love... Your your wealth more than freedom away from us. You know you know are not our countrymen. Right. I, I I remember that quote, but you know I, I also cannot remember who uh, who said that. That's a good one though. I want to say maybe maybe Samuel Adams. Um, you know I you know, what's so funny is um with our money. Okay, you know Bernanke is going to speak tomorrow. Of course, maybe stocks may go down. We'll see what happens. Um, because you know they're doing the QE four and it. Right. They're talking. I think I heard now in September they may actually reduce how much they're putting into um, the economy and stuff. That being said, with those things happening, 
you know, if there's an old saying, um, you know, it's if, if it's written on paper, it's worth the paper it's written on. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, people work so hard for this money that you now you look at Detroit. I mean, their pension plans, a lot of them, 80 percent gone now. How, how much of that? I think it was 80 percent. 80 percent. Oh, yeah. What um, what happens? Is, I mean, social unrest inevitably follows economic ruin. So that's why these economic disasters should be inspiring uh, a lot of concern among people. Mm-hmm. That, would, that would, like you say, when people lose that much of their their resources or that much of their money. Um, so that's why this should be a, a concern. You know, people, whatever inhibitions or resistance people might have to uh, to violent behavior or to thievery, they start to break down during desperate times. And, um, and, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, David Manning had a video out there, and I think it was four years old, but still I think it's very relevant. He said the white people are not going to take it anymore. I mean, they, they are going to riot. Well, I think all of them are going to riot. But he says they're, you know, they're sick and tired of all these policies being thrown at them. Um, yeah, th- there are a number of people. I mentioned Mark Stein earlier. Yes. Uh, he, he's, his most recent book, which was published two years ago, was called After America, Get Ready for Armageddon. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if he uh, literally believes in apocalyptic theology, but at least as a metaphor, he thinks that when, uh, when once the United States... Uh, loses its strength, loses its power, then we're going to see a terrible calamity in the uh, in, in the in this conflict between good and evil. And um, yeah, there is going to be terrible social unrest. Uh, okay. He thinks that there will be a fracturing of the United States politically. Yeah, that who was that uh, who was that Russian that said the United States was going to break up into five sections? Do you remember? Oh, I don't. I don't know. I haven't heard that. Well, there was actually a Russian, and they said that every time he's um, he's like a political scientist, or well, anyways, he was saying that the United States would break up into five different sections. You'd have the East, you'd have the South, and the Central, and such and so forth. Um, that would break up because you, because the basically they were saying back in the '30s, most everybody had the same thinking. You could go from the West Coast, East Coast, right. and had. But now we're we're so broken up. You see it where you're at where our way of doing things is totally different from the South and, and that. And that, that's what he, is, he was looking at. He, that's, um, that's valid speculation because, you know, a number of people have begun to use the term cold civil war mm-hmm. to describe the climate in the United States today. You know, it's not the active civil war that we saw in the 1860s, but it's uh, analogous to the Cold War that we had in the United States and the Soviet Union, not active fighting between the parties, but um, uh, but almost a state of ideological or philosophical warfare. What makes it different this time uh, from the way it was in the 1860s is that the uh, differences aren't separated regionally. I mean, these people, they're our neighbors, they're our co-workers, members of our family, these ideological differences. We are all intertwined. And, and that's what sort of makes it almost heartbreaking to see what's happening to our country. You know, these are people we know, and yet we're, um, we're being driven to such uh, such extremes that could result in some sort of catastrophe. Do you, you know, normally I'll ask questions for people when I come along and you know, in everyday life, you know, to kind of find out where people are at. Um, you know, and I'm going to find out more and more as I talk to people. They're secretly preparing, whether they're doing the guns or they're doing the food and that are you hearing that out there where you're at um i see it more on the internet than uh among people i mean mm-hmm. um so it's hard to me it's hard for me to report on it regionally okay. um, out here but it, it's interesting that you mentioned that though i do devote a chapter in my book to um taking preparation um what sort of preparations do you need to take uh, in anticipation of an emergency, what sort of supplies you have to have on hand and so forth. You know, here on the East Coast, we see hurricanes with enough regularity that most people have, uh, it has become a habit to, to be prepared for emergencies. Uh, but the emergencies could come in the way of other than natural disasters. They could come in the form of social unrest. So, um, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people here on the East Coast, at least out of habit, 
uh, are somewhat prepared, though probably uh, as frightening as it might be considering what we've seen with some recent hurricanes, the social unrest could be a lot worse than that. Yeah, and, you know, of course, out here, the only thing we really have to really deal with is uh, tornadoes. There's really nothing, anything else. And so um, it was it was kind of funny because um, uh, somebody I knew uh, looked in somebody's uh, refrigerator and said, what are you doing, preparing, preparing for Armageddon and got all this food in your refrigerator? Um, well. You know, <laughs> of course, you can just kind of just laugh at it. Um, you okay. know, I was um, there's a news site out there called King World News, and they talk about, you know, different people that are um, doing different things. And it was Eric Sprock. He was saying currently now in India, they're charging, I think, almost 10 percent tax on gold because people are buying gold so fast. Wow. Um, you've seen the lines out there in, um, you know, the, the South and the Asia and stuff, they like 10,000 people in line. But when you come to America, it's really strongly not encouraged to get gold. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, some gold ownership was, uh, outlawed for, for a while and, uh, people scoff at you, people laugh at you. Um, it's not, it's not a laughing matter in times of crisis. Uh, people do turn to tangible goods of value. You know, you read about during the Russian Revolution, people were uh, trying to get by with their, their jewelry, you know, when the economy collapsed uh, at that time. And there was great social unrest. And uh, that's, that's typical. In times. Mm-hmm. People are going to hold on to things of value. And uh, uh, gold is just as good as any. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how, how are people, what are, what are some of the comments and responses you're getting on your book? Um, let's see. I, again, the wilder curiosity is, yeah. uh, is the main uh, okay. response I'm getting. I haven't gotten a lot of feedback, uh, to tell you the truth. It is, um, as, as you probably know, um, what a lot of your guests have told you so far, it, it's tough to promote a book um, so and, and to uh, reach the readership. I mentioned that I went as a CPAC back in March. I mean, there are 10,000 people up there competing for attention, ranging from top tier politicians on down to um, college students looking for their first internship, so it, it's hard to uh, it's hard to get attention for this. But, uh, but I, you know, I, that, that's one reason why I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be on your show. Well, I'm going to definitely promote it. I mean, it needs to get out there. People need to wake up. Hey, you say that you need a publisher. Um, how would they contact you? Let's see. They can send an email to me. Okay. July dot four dot twenty fourteen at gmail dot com. That's July dot four dot twenty fourteen at gmail dot com. And again, my name is DC Allen. And now, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to hear from uh, from publishers. I was able to publish it myself on Amazon Kindle and Barnes and Noble Nook, uh, but I I would look forward to an opportunity for a print publisher as well. I, I'm very grateful I have it on my Kindle, but I tell you, there's something you're welcome. There's something to be said about having the book in your hand, though. Right. Right. <laughs> um, you know, you drop, you know, drop the thing and it quits working, whatever. Um, now, hey, you're on Facebook. Uh, let people know where you're, where they can find you on Facebook. Let's see. Yeah, I um, unfortunately I don't have a simple Facebook address, but okay. if you do a Google search for if you put it in uh, quotation marks, July 4, 2014, the day that freedom shall. July 4, 2014, the day that freedom shall. One of the uh, returns that will come up on Google is for my Facebook page. Okay. So I, I have blogs on Blogspot, WordPress, and Tumblr, and also this Facebook page. Yeah, because it's really important for people that are warning. And that's why I really like having you come on because um, I get a different perspective every time I hear from people because of something I've never heard or never knew before. And that's why having you on, um, people need to hear what's going on because it, it, we're in a current situation where – a lot of people are just basically blind. Well, um, one thing I do say, or, or I try to emphasize in my mm-hmm. book, is that in addition to trying to achieve um, a better state of liberty at the uh, political level, there are also are things that each person can do for himself or herself to start living a free life. You know, we, we don't have to wait. I, I mean, it would be nice if a movement did form in time to achieve these goals by, by next July. But even if that doesn't happen, there are things that each of us can do to start living an honest and free life. And um, you know, part, part of what you and a lot of your 
previous guests have emphasized, you need to start taking responsibility for yourself, being prepared, getting your financial affairs and personal affairs in order, stocking up on supplies, whatever might be appropriate. And um, we also need to live according to the ideals of freedom. And I, um, I include in my book the basic definition of what a free society is. It's not an idea that was original to me, but it's an idea that's important. It's that you do not initiate force or fraud against another person. Hmm. Do not initiate force or fraud against another person. And each of us just need to be conscious of that principle in our life. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you know. Of course, I haven't read the whole book, but as I read it, I have read it. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in there that are just. It's just practical. Just knowing practical about it, like I said, when you talk about your rights. Um, People don't understand, you know, so often in our country, we take our rights for granted, but we have no responsibility tied to those rights. Part of the problem is that people have been bombarded and sledgehammered with so many false notions about what rights are. Mm -hmm. A right to health care, a right to a job, right Mm -hmm. to education, right to leisure time, right to child care, right to all these things. Those aren't what rights genuinely are. And, but, but this is what people have been hearing all their lives. Mm-hmm. So it, it does become confusing to sort out what are our true rights and, and what are our false rights. And, and therefore, it's hard to recognize when our true liberties are under assault the way they are now. You know, I've really taken a, a turn um, towards the Constitution in the last, I'd say, 8, 10, 12 months, somewhere around there, because I... I didn't realize what was going on. I understood there was things that were wrong in our country, but I didn't realize I mean, there's so many things that we weren't taught about our constitution that we've lost. Yeah. And I'm like, going, Oh my gosh, you know, and, and there's so many people I want to tell and say, look guys, look at all these, our founding fathers knew. I mean, I was listening to one guy talk about how there was actually questions for fourth graders. And it's like, you would never heard that even in college because they were so smart. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, there, there is, there's definitely a problem with, uh, with education, whether it be in the public schools or in most of the universities, about what things people are taught. Um, I don't know what it was like when Barack Obama was a student at Harvard Law School, but it's my understanding, I might be wrong, but it's my understanding that currently at Harvard Law School, you're not required to take a course on the Constitution. And if that's true, either at Harvard or at any other law school, that, that is a real scandal. Um, and, and we can't expect fidelity to the Constitution to survive if, if it's not being taught even at our best law school. Well, and that's um, the one person that I was kind of mentioning that's um, um, as a politician in our family. Uh, they said the reason why I vote the way I do is because I was taught that way in college, and it wasn't the Constitution. Oh, could, could you, wait, could you re- restate that? Uh, oh, sure. Sure. Um, basically, they're, like a poli- they're a politician. And they said the reason why I vote the way I do is because oh. of my college. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, a matter of fact, I think there's an Alabama professor. Or don't I don't remember what school, but he requires all his law students to re- read the Federalist Papers and the Constitution and, before they'll even be graduated. Good. <laughs> so. Yeah. There's. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, Barack Obama made that. Uh, widely quoted remarks, I think it was about 12 years ago, about how the Constitution is, is an imperfect document that reflects deep flaws in American culture. Mm. That's, you know, after Barack Obama thinks about the Constitution. Well, there was a, um, a Prime Minister of Great Britain in the 19th century, William Gladstone, who said, the American Constitution is, so far as I can see, the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. So this is, this is a foreigner who is paying greater tribute to our foundational legal document than you're going to find uh, many people within our own country today. You know, and also in your book, you also mentioned about the Queen of England coming over here in the 70s. Oh, yeah. That and, was talk about that. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, coinciding, with, um, uh, coinciding with the bicentennial in, um, in 1976, um, Queen Elizabeth, the reigning monarch of the United Kingdom, uh, gave an address at Philadelphia, uh, just 
not not far from Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence was uh, was signed. And this was remarkable that a direct descendant of George the Third, a direct descendant of the monarch against whom we rebelled, would say the things that she did. And I'd like to read part of what she said in that speech, if we yes. Oh, go ahead. Take your time. Okay, this was uh, Queen Elizabeth in July of 1976, before the Bicentennial. It seems to me that Independence Day, the 4th of July, should be celebrated as much in Britain as in America, not in rejoicing at the separation of the American colonies from the British crown, but in sincere gratitude to the founding fathers of this great republic for having taught Britain a very valuable lesson. We lost the American colonies because we lacked that statesmanship to know the right time and the manner of yielding what is impossible to keep. But the lesson was learned. In the next century and a half, we kept more closely to the principles of Magna Carta, which have been the common heritage of both of our countries. We learned to respect the right of others to govern themselves in their own ways. This was the outcome of experience learned the hard way in 1776. Wow. Again, I think that's one of the best speeches that ever has been given on our soil. And it was a foreigner who said that. And that is really remarkable. People need to know what we lost. And we're not we're losing, I guess you could say more than lost. Um, but we still have that if people are willing to stand up. Um, okay. Um, we have here about oh, eight minutes or so. Do you see? That's okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah, this reminds me of something else I mentioned in both my book and in the uh, article that I posted on my blog in response to the Daily Camera that um, it was in early June that we observed the anniversary of the events at Tiananmen Square in mm -hmm. Beijing, 1989, when uh, our great brothers and sisters in freedom in China uh, stood up for their liberties, for their rights. And those were people who were inspired by the legacy of freedom in the United States of America. Wow. And that, that, really should, that really should move us more than I think it does. I mean, and what they were facing was a more ruthlessly brutal and corrupt regime than anything we face in this country. And, and yet they were, they, they had so much courage, and it was our legacy of freedom that inspired them. We, we need to learn, you know, we, we need to be inspired by, by their example. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know there's people that are standing up. Um but I hope that more will do it. Yeah, and, and we hope that it won't come to armed conflict like it did in 1776 or as it did in 1989 in China. I mean, we, we hope that it can be done peacefully. And the, the title of the essay that I wrote about the, North, about the secession movement in Colorado, the title is The Vote Heard Around the World. Mm. Whereas you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson referred to the beginnings of the American Revolution as the shot heard around the world. We can avoid violence, you know, just with the vote heard around the world. Uh, people in Colorado and elsewhere can, can stand up for their rights and stand up for their liberties. There was um, one, uh, one member of the uh, 51st State North Colorado Facebook page said, what happens here could influence what happens throughout the country, and he's right, and, and I hope I hope people in Colorado and elsewhere will will be uh, cognizant of that. Um, William Wallace, um, mm. uh, he he said, "People follow courage, not titles." People call, follow courage, not titles. That's right. That is very true. You know, because so often we see, well, "I'm a politician. I got a title." Well, what if we what if we have somebody that's a politician and is willing to stand up for what's right? People will will, will will do that. Um, people are just looking for a leader, and I think there's more leaders out there than we realize. That's right. And, um, you know, one, one thing I say in my book is I, I try to encourage people to, to get involved politically, to get involved in the campaign, maybe even to run for office themselves. And most people are going to say, oh, I don't have any experience in, in running for office. I'm not politically well-connected. I, you know, I don't. I, I'm not an expert in political philosophy. I can't do that. I mean, well, if you don't do it, then Barack Obama is going to do it. So, uh, I, people really need to have more faith in themselves and more confidence in themselves uh, that they do have what it takes to be leaders. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes. There are a lot of leaders out there. Well, you know, 
I, I guess most people don't realize they're a leader, but you know what though? When you, you know, sometimes people are just, you know, when they're called and do something, it can be bigger than them. But you know what? You you just learn to do it. That's right. That's right. I um, I in my book I describe an example of courage, and it's the courage that Winston Churchill showed when he was leading Britain through World War II. And I mentioned that Winston Churchill was he was a very often a very unhappy man. He had endured times of disgrace and failure. So in other words, he's a lot like us. Mm-hmm. And yet, when circumstances demanded it, he rose to the occasion. And we wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. He said that if Britain fell, all of civilization would fall, including the United States. And he's right. So, so we need to remember that these great leaders that we admire, they're people just like us. And we can find it within ourselves to, to, to show that sort of leadership. And I also say in my book that if, if people are uncomfortable about some of the shortcomings in their past, they need to they need to find some peace and look forward to the better and brighter days ahead. You know, DC, DC th- these are the days that really uh, separates the men from the boys. This is the days that men can make history, men and women. Right. Now, the Marxists will tell you it's the other way around, that history makes men, but, but I think you said it. Uh, the right way, and make it men and women make it. DC, this is a very good book. I, I really recommend that people would definitely get it. Hey, um, mention a few things about your book uh, where they can get it. Uh, mention your, your websites. Well, let's see. Yeah, I, I want to thank you again, Barry, for sure. promoting the book and for giving me the opportunity here. You've had a lot of thoughtful speakers on your program, so it's a privilege to be included among the rest of your guests. Thank you. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Again, for your listeners, my name is D.C. Allen. That's A-L-A-N. D.C. Allen, A-L-A-N. My book is July 4, 2014, The Day That Freedom Shall Be Restored. It's available on Amazon Kindle and Barnes & Noble Nook, and I'm looking for a publisher for a print edition. I have blogs on Blogspot, WordPress, Tumblr, and on Facebook. If you do a search on Google of July 4, 2014, the day that freedom shall be restored, you'll find links to the book and to uh, my blog. Well, that's, and, um, yeah. Okay. Well, they, you know, DC, that you know, I, I just can't more highly recommend the book. I mean, I just think that people need to definitely read this book. Um, you know, there's so many books out there that we can endorse, but I really would highly recommend this one. Um, you, you bring some practical thinking there that people just need to just understand some things that maybe they're not looking at. Well, thank you. I really do appreciate the recommendation, and I, I would be grateful if, uh, if some of your listeners did buy the book and, uh, and recommend it. And I'd, I'd also like to hear from uh, people. If people have some ideas or questions, they can contact me at july.4.2014 at gmail.com. Hey, DC, um, do you have any uh, other engagements that you, uh, people can maybe check on and listen to what you might be doing or, or other things you're doing? Um, let's, see. I, let's see. I don't have any other speaking engagements right now, okay. uh, but I, I do post on my blog almost daily. I try to comment on current events relative to the ideas that I present in my book. Um, I'm working on a lot of other projects. I've just written a screenplay for a film that I'm trying to find a studio to produce that. Oh, what's the film called? The film is called Year of the Rabbit. Okay. It's, uh, it's, not, a, it's not overtly political. It's a family drama and a light comedy romance, but it is informed by the same sort of worldview. Um, there's a comment that one of the characters makes. He mm-hmm. says, if you live a righteous life, you're more likely to live a good life. Mm. And that's true for individuals as it is in uh, the story in my movie, and it's also true at the political level. For me, if you live a right life, you're more likely to live a good life. DC, how can people follow, follow that? Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm just, right now, I, I've, okay. I've been in touch with uh, independent studios trying to, I haven't gotten any bites so far, but I'm, okay. that's my next big project. Well, definitely, that people be looking out for that. But DC, thank you very much for your time to come on this. I'm glad that you just shared all you did. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And I wish you and Julie well.
I'm DC Allen. I have just self-published a book, July 4, 2014, the day that freedom shall be restored. It's on Kindle and Nook, and I'm uh, trying to meet with other people who share the same interests that I do and that I express in the book. Well, that's really optimistic. I mean, July 4, 2014, that's like just barely more than a year away. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get rid of tyranny in, 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 in America in, in that much time? It seems, it seems a little optimistic. It's similar to any other situation in life. You decide what you want to accomplish, you set a deadline for it, and you take the steps that are necessary. The Founding Fathers passed a resolution for the Declaration of Independence. It was issued 27 days later. There's no reason we cannot follow their example. Wow. That sounds pretty gutsy. How does this work? I've, By the book, right? <laughs> I can summarize it. But yeah, it is on Kindle and Nook. I've identified four options that might be available to us. I've described what resources are necessary for a free, self-reliant, and self-sustaining society, both the minimums of population, land area, natural resources, economic resources, and so forth. And who knows if it would be followed exactly as, as I describe it, but I want people to start thinking about it instead of just wishing for it or hoping for it. What steps do you need to take to make this happen? Well, even before we do that, we, we really should come to an understanding of it, right? What is freedom? I do have an explanation about the how the ideas of freedom were derived, what they are, what is government. I mean, well, not, not ideas of freedom. There are lots yeah. of ideas of or related to freedom, but what is freedom definitionally? Yeah. Oh, freedom, well, I advocate the libertarian idea of freedom, that uh, the purpose of government is to protect individual rights. And I describe what genuine rights are as opposed to some of the false economic rights. What is government? Government is the institution that has the sole legal monopoly on the use of force. And I describe when it is legitimate and not legitimate to use force. You don't initiate it against others. Sounds like government could only be a set up to, to violate people's rights then. Isn't, isn't that kind of the, the, the premise? If you have uh, a, a monopoly on that, shouldn't there be a market for that in, in, a, in a truly free society? It's an institution that people create to, uh, to accomplish that protection of the rights. And again, I say it depends on the integrity of the people. It's true, there can be a tyranny of a majority. There can be people who don't have the right integrity and can abuse government power. It's an ever-present threat. I always say that the most important political battle is in your own heart. You have to distinguish between good and evil in your own heart. And it might not be something that we can guarantee. It's only that we can encourage the right things. Well, then how would this government that you propose fund itself? Um, well, the way that governments used to fund themselves before uh, Comp, you know, pervasive income taxation mostly was by selling of bonds. Now that's also how we've gotten into this terrible debt by well, selling and bonds. by borrowing and creating money, of course. Yeah. Um, well, I advocate a system of money based on some concrete, tangible value, such as precious metals, not the phony paper money that we have. It's through contributions, through selling of bonds, and so forth. Um, so you, would, so you would take the government and turn it from a monopoly of force to a voluntary cooperative, essentially? A business, even. A protection agency. Um, that's an interesting way to describe it. I mean, the powers that government would have are pretty few. The police, the courts, and the military. Those are things that everyone needs and, and that we always will need. And so, oh, well, I was in the military. I don't really need it anymore. And I think the founders were against the idea of, of a standing army. We do need protection from other, from against those who would try to harm us. Well, who's hold on? Who's who's us here, and and who's people that would would harm us? I mean, if it's if it's private property that is that is us that we're talking about defending, w wouldn't we be better off if instead of making a big collective of us that's a big target for people to attack, that also creates a government that's got a, a monopoly on providing protection services? Wouldn't we be better to follow the advice of the founders and have citizen-based militias or or even completely private defense contractors that, that would be able to, to respond to the needs of, based on actual threats as opposed to uh, what we see today with a government that comes up with excuses and fabricates attacks and, and does all sorts of things to, to justify what would, I, I'm sure you would agree is an absurd military budget. Well, a citizen-based militia is, is the right idea. You know, again, a, a military that's, uh, I, you know, I don't know how many more than 100 countries the United States military is based in right now. That's not a necessarily a good idea. We need a military to protect us. And you're saying, who's us? Who is we? 
the people who share this idea of the free society, the people who are working together cooperatively through their own choice to meet their needs, um, to realize their ambitions through free association, free contracts, and so forth, those people might come under attack from organized forces. It's good to have some, some plan for an organized force to uh, counter that. And again, uh, and you think you can you can form that non-coercively in this vision for government? Well, if everyone understands that it's necessary, yes. Again, it, it's an ideal, but if everyone understands that that's necessary, yes. If that they, we can have a standing officer corps. We can have a standing arsenal of weaponry for when it's needed to protect to protect us. Well, I can certainly support that if it's non-coercive, if it's if it's essentially run like a business or, or like a, a, a charity, as you say, if people are able to, to contribute or, or buy bonds and, and contribute to it that way, and no one in the territory is forced to be a part of this collective. So how is it that you're convincing by July 4, 2014, for people to, to embrace this grand vision for a non-coercive government? Well, I'm setting the deadline as a way of getting people to start thinking about it and you know what what steps need to be accomplished not just to keep hoping for it and wishing for it and depending on others what can you do to start living a free society and i say there are things you can start doing right now each individual to do right like now. what other than buying your book <laughs> which is which is again july 4 2014 the day that freedom shall be restored First of all, each person needs to have the integrity not to live a life dependent on coercing others, not, and also at the same time not to be submissive to government intrusions on our liberty. I definitely I advocate genuine civil disobedience, and I describe the distinction between genuine and false civil disobedience. What's the distinction? Genuine civil disobedience is when you protest an unjust law by violating that law. Let's say you oppose income tax. Don't pay it. Yeah. Don't pay it. It doesn't mean smashing the windows of the IRS building. That's vandalism. We don't oppose laws against vandalism. It means don't pay the income tax. And so, so I, do have a, I do have a list of 10 hypothetical situations where you can um, protest an unjust law by violating that law. For example, if, the, um, if law enforcement wants to see your ID, whatever that is, without a warrant, don't show it to them. Outstanding. Thank you so much. I hope your book thank does well. You. I hope you, you wake up a lot of people with this idea. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity.